Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast, episode 13, and you know the routine. <laughs> it's time for us to get into some dog training. In, t- in today's show, Instructor Shannon and I are going to talk a little bit about nature versus nurture and how it can affect your dog training. And I think, Shannon, you were mentioning uh, just before we started the show how many questions you had on this topic and why this might be a really advantageous thing for a uh, uh, a dog owner to understand, you know, maybe the dog's background. And again, I, uh, Shannon has written a really great article on our website for, uh, as a blog post that I'll link in the show notes below, but I haven't really jumped into your article yet. So I'm kind of looking forward to where this conversation goes mm-hmm. because I know as a, a dog owner who has had several different breeds of dogs, having been a, do- a dog trainer who has seen hundreds of different kinds of dogs that come into our training school that there are some breed tendencies you and bet. to understand them allows you to you know be a, maybe a little more effective or efficient trainer and i think that's what we're going to talk about absolutely absolutely we have both species tendencies and breed tendencies that we can use to our advantage if we know that they're there and we can identify them we can use those things to really strengthen our behaviors with our dogs and our relationship yeah and something that immediately comes to mind for me having a labrador retriever (laughs) as the dog that brought me to mccann dogs uh and knowing some of her tendencies but uh maybe more something that's more uh obvious to me is i have been uh competitive in sheep herding Mm -hmm. over the past few years and seeing some of the behaviors that have come from the border collies that I've competed with uh, has been really eye-opening. And then I see some of those behaviors in in everyday life and understanding some of those, uh, you know, choices that the dog makes because of something that they've been bred for over uh, a long, long time uh, allows me to predict when they might make mistakes. But no, I don't want I don't want to take us off too far off course <laughs> with sort of anecdotal stuff. But um, let's talk about maybe the difference. You know, what does nature versus nurture even mean? Yeah. And I mean, this is take this all with a grain of salt, of course, because there will always be arguments about what constitutes nature and what constitutes nurture. But For the basics, for the ideas behind the different species tendencies, as well as the different breed tendencies, you know, we can look at some of the things that the dog is naturally inclined to do as some of the hints that we will be able to take and then move forward with in our training. So as you said, with the Border Collie, you see all these really wonderful instinctual behaviors come out around sheep. And that is because... As humans, we get the opportunity to selectively breed purebred dogs, and we do so with the intention of continuing to persevere with specific qualities. So, for example, um, if you're looking at herding tendency, we want to make sure that we're breeding the strongest herders to other strong herders so that we can continue to have great herding instincts in those lines. And that is for the purpose of work with humans. It's for the purpose of play as well with humans. I mean, we do a lot of competing. Most of us, you know, you don't uh, own or or have a farm or a bunch of sheep, but you like to compete in sheep herding, which is absolutely great. And what is nicer than taking the dog's natural tendency and making that work to our advantage or even just having a window into it and seeing just what a beautiful thing it is when the dog comes out with something they know so well. It's never been taught to them. They just know it because generations behind them knew it. That is nature. And I love it. It oh, gets me really excited. Me too. Absolutely. <laughs> to see, uh, and that was it was so much fun for me. And I say this all the time when I talk to people who don't understand really what what sheep herding is i mean they know what it is but they don't understand the depths that you need to go to if you want to be competitive in it Mm -hmm. but to watch that dog uh just sort of flip the switch you know something for example we had a border collie named rad beautiful young dog he uh was kale competed with him in agility but we also competed he and i did training in sheep herding and he had never seen sheep before. And I took him to for an instinct test to see if it was something, you know, if he had any eye. And to see that little flip, the switch flip on for him, for, for him to become stocky. And it, I mean, he'd never seen sheep before. As you mentioned, we don't live on a farm. We don't have sheep. Mm-hmm. Uh, was was very, very cool. But you see this in a lot of reasons. I mean, you have uh, Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers. And, and I know before we jump into 
some some of the the nature versus nurture conversation you know tollers what what were they bred for mm. what's their background yeah so there's actually um there's a varied answer for this based on what type of toller you have gotten and i've had i've lived with both the piping type of toller and the ocean going type of toller ned is the ocean going type of toller he's much more hefty he's got a lot more in terms of chest and coat so that he can barrel into those the oceans along the coast of Nova Scotia and not feel that cold whatsoever. Um, and then there's a there's a little bit of a different toller that's a piping dog. And basically that dog was bred to sort of dance and make make very um, very light and, uh, and interesting movements along the shore. They're meant to actually mimic foxes in the tolling ability. Basically a fox will pair up with another fox or a couple of other foxes. One will hide in the bush and the other will sort of play along the shoreline. And there's this natural, uh, this natural phenomena where certain upland fowl will become transfixed by, by the fox and they will start to move in closer, at which point when they come within range of the other fox, there's an ambush. Um, with hunters, they will basically use that as a piping ability. So they'll use the dog to bring the uh, waterfowl in closer and then they'll use pipes to sort of capture the waterfowl. And this is how people ate for generations. You know, these dogs were bred for a long time in that area and with those two purposes. So those instincts are really strong in the dog. So you'll see a lot of really light movement with tollers, a lot of dancing movement with tollers, and a lot of a lot of desire to really quickly rush out, grab something, rush back and have that sort of rush action and then the retrieving ability after the fact of course once the hunter has been able to get them get their waterfowl the dog will swim out and retrieve the bird so that speaks to the nature side of things mm -hmm. um, but we know as trainers uh, that there's there's a balance you know that the, the, the nurture side is well let's dive in so so the nurture side what would that what does that mean to you what what would the average dog owner need to know about nurture when yeah. it comes to their training you bet. Nurture is what you do with those instincts. So from the time that puppy comes home, do you nurture those instincts to benefit you? Do you nurture those instincts in a way that works against your training? You know, there are so many things that you can do and there's so much foresight that you can have as well to get to a point where you bring that puppy home and you've already got a good idea of the things that you need to work on so that you're not ever relying on excuses of breed tendency to sort of say, oh, you know what? I can't teach a terrier to come when called. They right. just, they're, they're, the instinct to chase and kill things is just way too strong. You can't teach a terrier to come when called. That's simply not true. And knowing going into it when you have a terrier that that dog is going to have an extreme desire to chase and grab swift moving little creatures means that you're ahead of the game because you can set that up in your training. You can start right from day one teaching your terrier to chase you instead of wanting to chase other things and to be responsive in that chase as well. There's so many things that you can do to nurture the nature of the dog that will work in your favor. Yeah, and this is so often we hear people asking us questions like, oh, you know, can you, I couldn't teach a terrier, it's a pretty common one. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't teach my terrier to walk and leash their noses on the ground the whole time. Uh, I think we hear that, those kinds of comments so much. And I all I can say to people is, listen, you know, there's, for example, there, we'll be teaching on a whatever, let's say it's a Saturday, um, and, and there'll be a terrier in class, in the first class, and the first student might say like, oh, I'm really struggling. It's because he's a terrier. His nose is on the ground. And, and, and you know, the next class, we have this terrier that's walking on a loose yeah. leash brilliantly, you know, paying, it's, uh, focused on their handler. But it's because that second handler is really not used that as an excuse. You know, you either yeah. make excuses or you make changes. And that second handler understood that I need to work a little bit harder when it comes to walking on a leash because this it. breed of dog is uh, naturally a little bit more focused on the ground because maybe they have a background in, uh, you know, tunneling or, or you know, searching for whatever. Uh, um, it's really important. Now, we do, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about how, how we can use instincts or identify what instincts, uh, mm -hmm. what impact they'd have on our training. Yeah, for sure. Well, it, it, the instincts are what we need to nurture in order to get good behavior from our dogs. And we can direct this by making sure that we speak 
to the creature that we're actually trying to train. And this is where things tend to get very obscured for people on a on a bigger level because we look at our dogs and we know that they're dogs. We know that they're not little humans. We know they think differently from us, but we only know it sort of on an intellectual level as, as sort of a common sense in society. What we think about when we see their behavior usually falls back on human systems. So for example, if the dog chews on a shoe I, I, so many numerous times, people People come in and they they are just adamant that their dog was angry with them. Right. And that's why they chewed on the shoe. And, you know, I, there are a million reasons that a dog would chew on a shoe, including the fact that they love stinky things. <laughs> I mean, yeah. They're always about the stinky things. So that's going to attract their attention. And not that I'm saying your feet are stinky, of course, but <laughs> we generally have a certain smell to our feet. That, but they might be. I mean, if your dog's constantly be. chewing your shoes, you better check. If they are, <laughs> you're, you're way behind the eight ball already. So, <laughs> no, we want to make sure that... Um, we give our dogs appropriate things for those outlets. So if we don't and they're looking for something to sort of relieve the boredom or satiated desire to chew and they are attracted to the thing that smells, even that smells like you, you know, if you've left them home for the day and they're missing you or they're bored or they're lonely and they smell something familiar that brings them comfort, you know, that's that speaks to them as well. We have a relationship with them and they are wondering where we are when we're not there and when we're coming back. So that might bring a comfort to them. You know, it might have a situation where your dog goes to chew that shoe and smells it or goes to smell that shoe, pardon me, and then the smell just makes them want to chew. And then before you know it, they've torn it apart, which is so reinforcing for a dog. We come home and we say, oh, he was angry at me because I left him alone. And that is such an oversimplification. It really, it, the dog just didn't understand the shoe was off limits to chew. You know, they're not vindictive. They're not spiteful. These are things that we go to in our human minds. Dogs are different. You know, they think in the second, they live in the moment. And the results of those things are canine behavior, not human behavior. So we don't want to rely on things like... Um, Things like punishment um, that has us many moons after the fact reacting to the dog's bad behavior. So you come home to that chewed shoe, you see it, you get angry, and whatever your your punishment is, you know, whether it's maybe sending your dog to the crate for a timeout, that might be something negative for the dog depending on how they feel about their crate. If they feel really negatively about the crate, then that will probably serve as punishment for them. But it will never be associated with the act of chewing right. the shoe. Yep. It's far too removed. And we might be able to, with a child, say, you know what? You made a mess on the floor, so you don't get any dessert for dinner. Or mm -hmm. you're going to go to your room for a timeout. And we can rely on that because the child will sit and stew in the morality of the situation, right? Or at least that's the intention. You know, the child will sit and think, okay, my actions, resulted in this reaction. I didn't get any dessert. I missed my dessert. Therefore, my behavior will improve next time. Well, that is not how dogs think and learn. I mean, the dog getting into the garbage and getting to scavenge in the garbage, even if they don't find anything wonderful in the garbage, the nature of the dog as a scavenger has been satiated. And that is so rewarding. One example that you mentioned in your uh, article is uh, someone who was uh, seemed to be a really great, nice student, but she thought when her dog made a mistake, uh, if she removed uh, carrots yes. from the dog's dinner, that they'd really understand that they, you know, they'd made a mistake. And I mean, it's so outrageous to yeah. think that, but I think you know, big picture, you need to understanding the difference between how to deal with a child, how to deal with a dog. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're naturally built to deal with situations with children where we need to be think a little bit deeper because of the simplicity yes. uh, when it comes to dog training. Yeah, absolutely. That was actually one of, that's one of my favorite. In 21 years, it's one of my favorite stories of people trying to very nicely redirect dog's behavior. And basically this one was if the dog peed, peed in the house or the puppy peed in the house rather, the puppy would not get carrots on their kibble for dinner, which, right. you know, was presumably seven or several hours down the road, which I just thought was such a wonderfully endearing way to try to solve a problem, but it was it was the epitome of thinking in terms of human facts. <laughs> when you talked about um, uh, 
punishment, you use the word punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a difference between correction and punishment. And I think that's really important that we highlight that in this, uh, this episode. Also, you highlighted in your article. And uh, again, I'm, I'm going to drop a link in the show notes below. Definitely check out Shannon's article. It's really well written. Uh, but let's talk about correction versus punishment. What's the difference? Absolutely. So a correction is meant to change the behavior. And it's used in that moment in order to redirect or give the dog information. Punishment is meant to make somebody feel bad about the behavior. So it's a very different way of changing behavior. And it does work for humans. We use it all over in our society with mixed results, of course, and that's a whole other debate. Yep. Um, but there's lots of use for punishment in our society. In dogdom, punishment is usually an after the fact. It's usually based on, you know, moral codes and canines don't have the same moral code that we do. So they're not sitting in their crate thinking, oh, you know what? I chewed that shoe. Now I'm isolated from people and life is horrible. So next time I'm not going to chew that shoe. The reinforcement value was so high for that dog that Chewing the shoe was the right thing for them in the moment. There was nobody there to say, you're wrong. And they got through it and they walked away and life went on. And now there's this thing happening that's completely disconnected in terms of being of benefit whatsoever. This punishment thing is not going to change the behavior simply because that's not the way dogs think. There's no association there to begin with because it's just, it's far too big of a concept. It's far too much of a human concept to give the creature time to sort of think about what they did. Um, rather than that, if the dog was in the garbage, in the moment, a correction would be a quick redirection. You know, it might be a scold with your voice. You might say, hey, get out of that garbage. And then the dog the dog's behavior is corrected. You know, it doesn't have to be ugly. Right. You know, it doesn't have to be this mean, nasty, violent thing at all. It just has to be something that corrects the behavior. And I think that's where people get confused. The idea of the least correction yes. is the best correction. 100%. As we try to move away from the dog making these kinds of choices, we talk about this a lot. Yeah. You know, the, the least amount of input that we can have for the dog to choose something better is, uh, is definitely something that we focus on. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, just to sort of uh, summarize really quickly, correction is, well, timed mm -hmm. and involves some sort of redirection. You bet. Yeah, yeah. You bet. And it's not meant to punish. It's not meant to try to make the dog feel sorry for what they did. It's meant to teach the dog that is an inappropriate thing. You talked a little bit about the idea of a timeout or, or you know, I, I, you mentioned that. And I think, um, you know, he, Dealing with children, again, I don't have any kids, but I know dealing with children and timeout is something that's pretty commonly mm -hmm. used in a lot of households. Um, there are times when you can put your dog in the crate because they're making a bunch of bad choices. You but bet. <laughs> you need to you need to think about it in a way that it's not a, a timeout. It's not a punishment for making those bad choices. It's an opportunity to keep the dog out of trouble. You bet. So uh, let's talk about maybe a situation where putting a dog in their crate isn't isn't a punishment. Mm -hmm. It's just a management uh, opportunity. Absolutely. And this is how we teach. You know, we use things like our crate so that we can manage our puppies. We can manage our dogs and they're not getting into mischief when we can't watch them. You know, if my dog is safely in their crate when I leave the house, there's absolutely no risk of him chewing a shoe unless I've left the shoe inside his crate with him, which I'm probably not going to do if I don't want him yeah. chewing shoes. Yeah. So this is a perfect setup. It allows the dog to exist, but exist safely. And it allows the dog to exist without knowing all the rules of the house at that point as they're working on acquiring that knowledge. So as we're doing that training, you know, eventually we want our dogs to be able to be loose in the house and understand clearly that chewing that shoe is off limits. But if you do it in reverse and you give them the freedom rather than the management and they do get to the chew and they do chew the shoe, the rehearsal factor there and the reinforcement value, again, when, if we go back to the example of the garbage, if we let our dogs rummage through the garbage, there is a huge reinforcement value just in the rummaging, rummaging value alone. They don't even have to find anything tasty in order to get rewarded for run, rummaging in the garbage. Same thing can be said of counter surfing. You know, if yeah. they get to investigate what's up on that counter in yeah. any way, there's already a re reinforcement there that speaks to their nature as scavengers and as rummagers. 
managers, I'm having trouble <laughs> with that word, one, yeah. it is yeah. looking for food. So we need to prevent those rewards from happening while we build other systems. So I'm not always going to resort to redirecting my dog for getting his nose in the garbage. So I want to go to a teaching phase with yeah. that first. I want to have my dog safely sectioned in their crate when I can't teach and when I can't watch them. And then when I can watch, I'm going to bring my dog out and I'm going to set up little drills in the kitchen that help me convince him, that help me nurture his nature to want to stick his nose in the garbage. And I'm going to redirect that to reinforcement value elsewhere. So for example, um, a couple of episodes ago, actually, we talked about this with Reggie because Reggie is my opportunist. He's the one where his nature means that if I open the um, cupboard door to the garbage and slide it out, if he didn't have something else in his head that I had planted there in place of his instinct, he would be in that garbage rummaging in a second. So with Reggie, I made sure that I just set up a little bit of a training session a couple of times, and then he learned it was much more valuable for him to hang back, you know, 10 feet from the garbage and look at me expectantly. So basically, we would just open the door, slide the garbage out, and then I yes and fed him for being 10 feet away. No big deal. This is, this speaks to the um, the people who will say, well, you know, this to teach your dog to stop jumping up on the counter. This is great mm -hmm. as long as I'm there. But as soon, how am I supposed to deal with this when I'm not in the room? Yeah. I mean, this is why I thought we. I really wanted to uh, double down on this idea. You need to manage your dog you because bet. you, if you, if you aren't sure, this isn't an op. You, this isn't a time to t to test your dog. Yeah. you need to be. You need to do some training with when you're able to redirect them, when you're able to correct those bad decisions. Um, because what you're trying to do is build value for not jumping up on the, in the counter, for, for not digging in the garbage, because naturally the dogs mm -hmm. want to do these things. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And if you can preempt that natural instinct by giving them a replacement behavior, right? So I didn't allow Reggie to come in and investigate the garbage and then try to like reward him 10 feet away a couple of times because that's shooting myself in the foot, right? That's Reggie saying, oh my gosh, I just realized there's huge value for sticking my head in that garbage. Now I'm going to take that away. You know, and that that just makes my life more difficult. Yeah. So the management comes to make sure that Reggie doesn't learn that sticking his head in the garbage is a really awesome and valuable thing to do before he learns that not sticking his head in the value is a re or not sticking his head in the garbage yeah. is a really valuable thing to do for sure. Um, I mean, we talked a little bit about breed instincts, and um, I can think of a couple of situations. We had, we did a live stream uh, with a, a, a Dr. Vanessa Tun from Yukon. Nuba uh, last week, and she was talking a little bit about food drive. And um, you can also use some of these breed instincts to, to your advantage. You know, Labs, for example, I was you talking bet. again about Deegan. I talk about her a lot, I know. <laughs> but I was talking about her in, in uh, saying that I had to be careful that she didn't become overweight because yeah. Labs are quite food driven. And um, Dr. Vanessa mentioned that that was made sense because they were bred to dive into the thrush and the yeah. ice water to go get, uh, you know, the fowl that had been uh, shot or whatever. Um, you know, these kinds of things really, uh, knowing that I was careful. I, I knew that I could use food to my advantage when it mm -hmm. came to training, but I didn't want to overdo it because I, she wouldn't give me the signal that she'd had enough or that she had yeah. had too much. I just There's needed no to be aware of There's no too much for a lab. <laughs> right. But I'd also be very careful when it came to things like jumping up on mm -hmm. the counter. If I had food up there, you know, she's naturally really food driven. So, uh, uh, you know, I was very careful, even with all the bad choices that I made, to be honest, before I came to McCann Dogs with her, you know, puppyhood and, and, and puppy training. Um, I was always cautious about giving her access to things that could get her into trouble. Um, Good instinct on your part. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. Um, but uh, knowing that, I knew that I could, knowing that she had high food drive, I could also go into a little bit more challenging situations when I was in a public space mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, out for a walk after I finally got some skills here at McCann Dogs, um, you know, using a, a kibble. 
for yeah. example. You know, I didn't always need to use the super high value foods. I could use mm -hmm. those lower value foods because I had a dog with high food drive. Yeah. Um, so, so is, you know, are there any things on top of mind where you can use breed instincts to your advantage? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, depending on the breed that you're dealing with, we, we touched on terriers a bit and let's stay there because we talk a lot about sporting breeds. Um, so with terriers, for example, they love to tug, they love to bite on things that are, you know, rodent like this is what they're bred for and they're tenacious and we don't want to label them as stubborn when we breed them to be tenacious and we look at it as a great quality when they're facing rats but a not so great quality in the rest of life you know we want to use that to our advantage so if I had a terrier, I would be using a lot of, you know, furry toys in my training yeah. so that I had a great outlet for that dog's tug drive and need to and desire to, you know, face vermin. So mm -hmm. instead of using a lot of food with a terrier, I would probably have a much higher value on toys because my terrier is going to love to play with toys. And basically anything that I can use in term that brings value naturally to the dog, like that fuzzy toy. You know, if I have a real fur toy with a terrier, they're going to innately desire that, mm -hmm. you know, probably. You know, there's a really high percentage yep. that that terrier is going to innately desire that fuzzy toy. So now what I can do is I can transfer the value of that toy to things that I want him to do. And it can start being about the things that we are going to do, you know, as a team, as a partnership, going for walks in the community and being a good canine citizen, not chasing other dogs in the neighborhood, et cetera. So I can build those skills by using that toy as reward because that outlet is so innately reinforcing for the dog. It speaks to their nature so much that I'm already halfway to my goal. You know, if if I'm dealing with a, a retriever, for example, you know, my my own retrievers I know from living with them, they have soft mouths as yeah. a rule. This yeah. is part of what their breeding is. They need to be able to go out, get the duck, not damage it when they bring it back. So I have to build tug drive. And it's definitely going to take me a longer time in that process with my retriever to build tug drive than it is. Actually, that would make a good episode as well. Yeah. Then it is, then it will be to build tug drive in my terrier in all likelihood. So I can use that to my advantage. And He's going to get lots of rewards on recall, for example, for chasing me and running into me. He's going to get that great furry toy reward. Yeah. Uh, you also talk a little bit in your article about Ned being a thief. Ned is a thief. Yeah. We, need, we should definitely <laughs> talk about this because yeah. uh, that's a strong statement, Shannon. Yeah, you bet. You know what? I've had four thieves. I've had <laughs> uh, four tollers and every single one of them has been thieves. And this sort of speaks to the nature of the breed. What I want to be able to do is use that thievery to my advantage. And... Uh, you know, after living with Tollers for a while, it became obvious to me that their thievery was more about the excitement in the moment and their desire to have something in their mouths. It wasn't this, you know, bratty little behavior where they were trying to play keep away. They just felt joyful and they wanted something in their mouths as part of that experience. So, you know, we would be, okay, it's time to go for a walk and they would want to grab something in their mouths, et cetera. And as that became evident, I realized that I didn't want to squash that joyfulness. I wanted them to be like, oh, we're excited. We're going somewhere and associate that with all those wonderful things like having things in their mouth. So now I can use that as part of my tugging. I can use that as part of my my reward system in training, et cetera, because there's already this innate joy there. So using that to my advantage, what I did was I just made sure that there was something appropriate for them, that they were more inclined to go and grab. So we spent some time, rather than just letting them willy-nilly run and grab whatever toy or whatever shoe or whatever remote control they wanted to grab, we set up little training situations where I would, you know, tuck a toy on, in the corner and I'd get them excited and then get your toy. And we would, hopefully that didn't blow everybody's ears out. <laughs> we would run and get the toy. So basically I channeled that drive away from needing to, you know, go and find their own item to grab for their mouths to giving them an appropriate item to grab for their mouths. So it became a joyful thing that was allowed to continue to be joyful. And of course, there was still very clear lines of what they could and couldn't grab. This is normal puppy stuff. But that benefit of being able to already start some of my reward systems with that innate desire already in play and already being nurtured it just makes training that much easier if you can figure it out. Yeah, in, in thinking a little bit about, um, you know, lots of people have mixed breed dogs and you may get a, a balanced uh, uh, a balanced amount of each of the yeah. breed instincts, breed traits from your dog. Um, but the, what, what I want you to really think about is uh, the fact that 
if it's not, you know, if you have a Labrador retriever that isn't, uh, you know, super food motivated, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not an absolute thing. It's something that you need to uh, kind of consider uh, understanding the breed history. Now, really quickly, uh, where would people find out a little bit more? You know, these things can be trained. Where would people find out a little bit more about, about some of the breed instincts and uh, the, the nature of their dog? Where, where, where yeah. could people go to find out more about that? You bet. Kennel Club websites are a great place to get started because they usually give you the the breed standard. There's a blueprint right. for every breed that comes along with them. When you're picking your breed, think about the things that you like. And in addition to that, think about the things that you don't like. Because if you can live with the negatives, the positives, of course, are great. They're easy to live with. But if you don't like barking, for example, as a rule, you know, you probably want to steer clear of collies and shelties because their innate nature has such a barking presence to them. And that's not to say that you can't teach a Sheltie or a Collie not to bark, sure. but it's a very different thing than teaching a Lab or a Golden not to bark because that instinct, anytime there's stimulation, movement, et cetera, a Sheltie is going to want to bark. So you will need to, if you don't like barking and you decide to get a Sheltie, you'll need to figure out how to bridge that gap so you yeah. can leave ha live happily with that dog. Yeah, yeah. Really important. And, you know, we always encourage people to have a, a, a thorough understanding of the breed that they're getting if they decide to, uh, to, to get a dog, bring a dog home for their family. It's not about how it looks. Mm -hmm. It's about some of these uh, instinctual things. It's about, you know, what do you want to do with your dog? Because that's just as an important of a cho decision when it comes to picking your dog. Now, uh, we're a little short on time, so uh, I'm going to I'm gonna end the show here. Um, but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I really find this stuff quite interesting. Me too. And um, after we mention that, I'm going to I'm going to include another link, maybe to something about uh, breed specifications and histories and things. I'll see what I can find and I will include it in the show notes below. But um, if you're looking to take a look, uh, if you want to take a look at Shannon's articles, uh, I'll link that in the show notes. It's uh, called Nature, Ver Nature versus Nurture, using both to improve your training and relationship with your dog. And this is something we believe uh, quite, quite a lot here at McCann Dogs because we've seen so many dogs and it just rings true exactly every single time yeah on that note i want to thank you guys for joining us uh, i'm ken i'm shannon happy training guys bye for now bye everybody i hope you enjoyed this episode of the mccann dogs podcast and if you'd like some more training resources be sure to check us out on youtube instagram and facebook at mccann dogs and if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program where we know in just a few weeks your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training!